had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. But I really want to get in today on AI and the hive mind to begin with. And in the book of Revelation, he says, and he gave power, he had power to give life into the image of the beast. And we have pondered for quite a while what that's going to be. You know, and is, is it going to be an automaton? Is it going to be a robot? Is it going to be a hunk of mud? What is it going to be? And I'm going to try to get into that a little bit today of some possibilities of what it can be. And that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And no man could buy or sell or save he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now, there's a lot of things that we can look at historically about the mark of the beast and, and this image of the beast. What's interesting is when you look at the one of the things the elite do, and this is one of the things that uh, I bring out in the Shadar Directive, whenever you deal with classified material, I'm, I'm ex-military, uh, you, you can have all the way up to top secret, everybody knows what top secret is. But what you don't realize is there are levels of security above top secret. One of them is called compartmentalization. And let's say that I and Josh Tolley are working on a specific project and it is above top secret and it is compartmentalized. When we're in that room working together, we can, we can talk about that. Now, we're given just a piece of the puzzle. We can talk about it openly. We're dealing with issues. The moment that we leave that room, even if we're talking to one another, what is in that room does not exist. Complete compartmentalization. And so one of the things the elite have done globally is they have all these different groups, sometimes even competing nations that are in, race, that are in uh, arms races, developing pieces of the puzzle, but they don't have the whole puzzle. They just have one component. It's only the ones behind the curtain that are pulling the strings that have, that understand the full plan and how that this piece from Russia is going to fit with this piece from China as well as connect with this piece in America and that when we pull it all together, we will be able to do whatever we're planning to do. And as I begin to look at this, some of the things that we want, I want to look at today is, is a possibility of how the image of the beast is going to work and understanding what it is. And it's going, to, it's going to involve artificial intelligence. It's going to involve the hive mind. Anybody ever hear of the hive mind? Transhumanism and transhumanists are, are, is all about becoming human 2.0, 3.0, or whatever, whatever direction they're wanting to go. We hear a lot about 5G, quantum internet, Blockchain, anybody here at blockchain? Okay, blockchain, one of the uses is going to be cryptocurrency. Okay, they're going to move toward that because you have to have that to have a universal currency. But what nobody's connected is blockchain is going to be instrumental for the universal ID. You're going to be blockchain. Okay, Internet of Things. How many of us have an iPhone, whatever? And that, that's an inter, that is a, a, a part of the things of the internet, right? But once it's all networked, their plan is you're going to become an internet of things. See, each piece is a piece of the puzzle. And when you, when you look at it, what's amazing, people like Elon Musk is, is saying, we don't want AI. I don't want anything to do with AI. AI, have, have you not watched sci-fi? We don't want to invent Skynet. We don't want to involve these things. But you know, his company may be actually developing pieces and the components that he doesn't think has anything to do with AI, that he's actually building part of their systems because he doesn't get to look behind the curtain. 
And so one of the things I want to do today is, from my viewpoint, is trying to figure out possibilities of how all these things can knit together. And when you do, you begin to see a picture that becomes a false God, a false body of Christ, a false Holy Spirit, and it's going to be a force to be reckoned with. I want you to think about that. On a planet that you can't hide, on a planet that you've been blockchained and you can't edit it, you can't escape from it, and you, 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 know, you can't do, like, do a facial recognition, you can shave your beard and you can put you know, a little black hair and a little black hair and it messes it up and it can't recognize you, all that's going to be history pretty soon. We need to understand these things that are going on and what, with, with the threat that we have of AI. And let me tell you something, we're, there are a lot of us that are dealing with AI on a daily basis and you don't even know it. Did you know, for some of us, you call your credit card company and that sweet little lady, you think, thank God I didn't get a computer. And man, she knows all about you. Well, Mr. Lake, we're, it's, it's been three months since we've, we've had any problems with you. How can we help you? I see you've done this and you've done that. There may not even be a human that I'm talking to. The computer, the moment that I called in the A, I pulled up my history of everything that's going on. And she, you know, how's your wife, Mary? All that's going on, and we think it's barbed down in Cincinnati. You know, that's like the, the old days, you got somebody from India, and his name is John. You know, you know at least now they're signing, you know, and they're getting put out of business because AI is taking over. AI is beginning to give business solutions that they're, they're, they're confessing. Listen, the top experts in the world can't figure this out. We ask an AI, and the AI gives a solution that no human would ever do, but when you do it, it works. That's where we're headed, and that's some of the things that we need to prepare ourselves for. Now, a lot of times the, in the old school, when they would read the, the image of the beast, we, we would think of the old story of the golem that the rabbis talk about, and which is significant because you have God took mud, put it together, breathed life in it, and Adam lived. Okay, so there's this creation story of becoming God-like and creating. And so now man is saying, I'm going to create something in my image yet is going to be superior to me. And within, within Kabbalic legend, uh, part of it is, you know, they, there's different stories and it, it really varies. But one of them is, if you know how to say the tetragrammaton, you know, is it Yahweh, Yahovah, Yah, you know, uh, Yahvah? Jesus cleared it up for us. He said, call him Father. Because by the time Jesus came along, because of, of, the, word of uh, the name of God being so abused in Babylon, in fact, where we get the word Yahoo, was that the Jews were made fun of, and it so grieved them that they called them Yahoos, they quit saying the name. So the time we get to Jesus, they had quit saying the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Heh, which encoded in, in, the, in the name is, he is the God who will be revealed twice with a nailed hand. yod heh vav -Heh. And Jesus didn't pull him aside and say, let me show you the secret sauce. He said, believe in me, call him Father. And so sometimes a lot of the things, and, and how do we exactly when we say it, you know we're going to find out for absolutely sure when he shows up. And then we're going to know as we're going to, you know, we're going to look back at a lot of the arguments we have had over things, and we're going to say, I was still in kindergarten, it's like two kids fighting over a piece of candy. When there's bigger things, there are bigger fish to fry that we need to be involved with in the kingdom. How'd I get off? And okay. Oh, yeah. They would say the sacred name, and it would come to life. And part of that was saying, if you let it live one day, it calls you master. You let it live two days, it calls you friend. You let it live three days, it calls you slave. And so that kind of goes in with the golem motif. But I, I think what, what we're seeing with AI, and that they have been very braggadocious about it. They're, they're looking for that singularity. That it becomes self-aware. And the very ones, and this gets me about atheists and scientists, they deny the God of the Bible, yet they're constantly working on either creating a God or becoming one. So why are you spending all your time trying to become or make what you deny exists? It's ridiculous. 
but they're driven to do it. There is a force behind them. And I want to look at a couple of slides, if I can advance to the right ones here. An AI God will emerge by 2042 and will write its own Bible. Will you worship it? Now, because of 5G, they have changed the date, and Kurzweil has churned, changed the date to 2030. At the same time, the UN has moved their 2020 thing to 2030. Everybody's going to 2030 like there's a bullseye on that date. And there's a lot of things that they're trying to put together. Here's another one. Des Ex Machina, former Google engineer, is developing an AI god. And it moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> it does. It comes up with solutions that a human would never figure out. Here's another one. God to be replaced by AI, new religion to be created by computers. This, and, and you know, you go and you search this on Google, and I had millions of articles that I could have chose. These are just random that are on there. They're being quite blatant about it. Is AI a threat to Christianity? Let me tell you something. I don't care what AI that you build. He is no match for Almighty God. If God could have a bad day, the AI still would not have a chance. Come on now. Now, I'm going through a lot of this quickly because I want to get to the good stuff, okay? Let's, let's deal with what they're doing. There's some other things that I'm beginning to hear. They're talking about hive mind. I, I first became aware of this with some DARPA projects. They wanted to be able to give soldiers hive mind. That means they turn them into drones and they move as a single force with a guy back somewhere in Langley or whatever, now in Denver because they moved everything that we found out at lunch today. Uh, they, the, the guy sat in their back with a joystick moving them in. In fact, there was, a, there was a series on TV for a while called Dial House, which dealt with MK Ultra, that kind of thing, kind of a little bit different version of it. And part of what they ended up having were these troops that were dolls that were taken out because they were ex-military, they were programmed with a hive mind, and the men had a hard time fighting the influence of the, of the overlord of the hive mind with what they're supposed to do. But what's interesting about this article that they bring out. Let me see if I can find the right page here. And this is from the article because humans, although they say it would be beneficial for humans to have hive minds because, you know, a single bee can be stupid, but you get a whole hive of bees, a swarm mentality, they can figure out complex issues that are beyond the single bee. So wouldn't it be great if humans could do that? If we could all just get together, we, we could use our combined computing power to solve world problems. Here's the problem. We pride ourselves in being rational thinkers with an inherent sense of morality that guides our actions toward the greater good. These virtues are true uh, across all levels of society, yet collectively, on a global scale, we often make self-destructive decisions. He goes on to say, this begs the question, how can uh, immoral decisions emerge from a society comprised overwhelmingly of moral individuals? Philosophers have been pondering this for ages. Nietzsche lamented madness is rare in individuals, but in groups, political parties, nations, and eras, it's the rule. And so they go from Nietzsche, they, bring, they jump over to a renowned American theologian, Reinhold Nuremberg, was uh, even more blunt, expressing the group is more arrogant, hypocritical, self-centered, and more ruthless in the pursuit of its ends than the individual. One of the things I learned in the military is you can, you can make sense with an individual. Like if I'm dealing and there's a crisis, I can make sense of an individual. A crowd is stupid. A crowd will turn on you in a minute and kill you. That's why you have to always maintain control. And so this is from the Singularity Institute where they're trying to actually get all the scientists together to bring about the AI singularity. And they say, well, here's what we have learned from the internet. And have anybody ever seen social media go the wrong way? <laughs> I don't mess with it anymore. It's like, you know, there, there's some people that I really love, but uh, <laughs> there's some that is this, it's, it's shown the worst in us because they can't come beat you up, you know? I mean, some, I, I've, had, I've had people say some things to me, either in an email or on, on social media, 
that it was face to face, it'd be on. Okay. I'll repent later, but there's, there's, you know, especially you don't mention Mary Lou in a negative context. It's, it's on. All right. And they, they have the audacity to do that because they're setting a thousand miles away. Usually it's a 45 year old living in his mama's basement, but let's, let's uh, get on to other things. Um, but it, it, we, we see it in schools that kids begin harassing somebody because there's a bully and all the kids jump in on it to the place the child commits suicide. And so they're saying, how can we have this hive mind without it going bad? And then, so you bring up places like Reddit and everything that people don't realize you have an AI manipulating the conversation to bring out the good, to, to, to gently escort the conversation to get everybody focused on the right things with this premise we can have a hive mind to benefit humanity as long as it is guided by an all wise AI. I read that and went, oh no. Because they're, 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 they, they take steps, they're guiding us someplace. They want to create a God. And what I eventually believe we're going to have D-Wave and a lot of these things to come together. I, th I think CERN, and I agree with Anthony Patch, I think CERN has, and, and has two main components that they're doing. Number one, there's a prison that God created that we find in the book of Enoch. That, you know, we, we know that in the book of Enoch, after 70 generations, they were going to begin to be released. I think it's a progressive releasing, but I think that they're not satisfied with that progressive releasing, so they're trying to crack God's prison. And men's hearts will begin to fail for that which comes upon the earth, stuff that he worked to release himself. The other, I believe that, I believe there is no computer, there is no programming on the planet. I don't care if it's D-Wave, quantum, whatever, whatever else want them that they want to do. I do not believe that it in itself can, re can achieve sentience. But I believe that they can build a construct that a watcher can inhabit and assume its place as a God upon the earth that serves over a digital domain. And so, but you have to have also, if you have a God, you want to be connected to that God. You see, it's an imitation, a poor imitation of what we have in Jesus. The day that you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life and really got right with him and you weren't playing with him, it wasn't a 30 second prayer. It was, and I, I think we need to let people sit on their knees and cry and squall and ball gut until they get it right. Because we have a lot of sinners get up from the altar and they've not repented. They've responded to an emotional appeal and they get up a sinner and now they're running churches. That's part of the problem that we're having today. You stay at the altar and you wrestle with God until God touches the hollow of your thigh and you get up and you walk away a different man because your walk has changed. But when you do, the Holy Ghost moves in and you're connected to God. God moved on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit moved on the inside of the aspect of God that is extremely knowable. It empowers everything that he does on planet Earth. Well, they got to imitate that. 5G is more than just your cell phone. You know, they already got plans beyond 5G. I've got an article that I, just, I finished reading here about a month ago. They said 5G is the first step, and they're already putting the components into 5G for the upgrade. It's called quantum internet. What does that mean? You get at the quantum level. Quantum level is perfect for blockchain because with blockchain, you're not supposed to be able to hack it the minute that you touch it. It's your, your, your digital fingerprints are permanently recorded on it, and all you need is a little bit of the data of the blockchain. Of the blockchain, you can put it on another computer, and it will replicate itself to replace all the information that you thought you deleted. And when you look at blockchain and look it up on Wikipedia, they give they give uh, uh, a, a Japanese name, which is a pseudonym for the creator of blockchain, but he doesn't exist. And some have said, you know, it's this guy, it's this crew, it's this crew. Many researchers are now beginning to believe that it was AI that developed the concept of blockchain to begin with. 
and it's going to go well beyond currency. It's blockchaining whoever is digitally connected. But when you begin dealing at, with quantum encryption, quantum encryption goes beyond blockchain. Let's say I'm going, let's say John here has something in, that's quantumly encrypted and I'm going to try to hack it. The moment I reach out and touch it, my blockchain ID is permanently attached to it and he's immediately notified that I touched his data. Not even that I was able to unencrypt it because you can't quantum encryption, but you can't even touch it without the owner being immediately notified. And when you get into quantum internet, that means it is going to be, it, it, is, it, it goes beyond the 5G radio waves. It's going to blanket this planet at the quantum level with, with connectivity. That means, that means at the cellular level, everything, I don't know, I don't know if you can set up a, a Faraday cage or not that will block a quantum internet. That, and, and you don't have to worry, everybody gets five bars, okay? <laughs> everybody gets gigabit plus connection. The thing is, you begin putting it all together. They create a deity. They're moving us toward hive mind, and the only way that they can move us toward hive mind is it has to be AI guided. The transhumanists are going to want to integrate with the AI to their God so that they can be upgraded that we're gonna have a global network that you can't run from, that we're gonna have blockchain, that not only is there a digital currency, you have to be a part of the digital community to be able to buy or sell, and that you can't escape this new universal digital ID, and that all of us beca become the internet of things. You see, one of the things I have pondered is, okay, now when you receive the mark, you can't repent. So it has to be something that completely affects the mind and the will. And I have pondered, is it simply a, a DNA upgrade that once you, you know, they're going to try to make everybody gibberim or Nephilim like, like Nimrod had done. And so does it so change your DNA, you're no longer human to, to have the possibility to repent? Because I think there's a threshold that God says, now ah, when you go past this, you're no longer human. You don't get to repent. But if we, if we go with an ambiguous interface. That means there are no smartphones. It's embedded right here. That you have access to all the world's knowledge, that you can communicate with anybody anywhere. You can tap into the hive mind. You can share with the wealth of the communication of the world while you're gently being controlled by the AI. Oh, nothing can go wrong with that, right? Well, what did sci-fi tell us? Let me get to the right thing here. Let's see what Jean-Luc Picard says. <laughs> we see in the book of Revelation, they know Jesus is coming back. So his approach, just like we're detecting the burrow, we talked about that at lunch today, and they know it's coming. And we, we have things pointed out into space to detect stuff. They know when he comes that he's coming. So it, how, how that happens, I don't know. Can, can they, you know, does he open up a dimensional portal out by Pluto and work his way in? I don't know. But they know he's coming and they know his wrath is here and they shake their fists at him and curse him knowing that he's coming and getting ready to judge. Why do they do that when they know it's him? It's like, oh, poo, all the Christians were right. Maybe I need to repent. No! Your will has been taken away by the AI. Because you know the hive mind can turn ugly within humans and therefore that ugliness has been suppressed and you brought into, into harmony with this new God. You see, these are some of the things that we're going to face when the Lord come, you know, before the Lord comes back and then you have the UFO showing up and all kinds of other things. And they said, oh, we see you got our present, the AI, that's what we did in Roswell and gave you the components we knew you'd get there. It's a very real possibility. But what I want to deal with is it's time for us to grow up. You see, because all of this is simply a cheap, techno, watcher-based imitation of what we really have possible as believers. 
but they have purposely kept us in infancy. In fact, they took us out of semi-maturity and dumbed us down to the place that in in a day that you can do in-depth theological analysis with a push of a button on your computer, that you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew, but you can pull up some of the most famous lexicons on the planet in English and research Greek and Hebrew and all the wealth of these things. Biblical illiteracy is at an all-time high in the pulpit. You see, a lot of the stuff that Josh was dealing with, if those preachers would actually open up their Bibles and begin reading it from cover to cover, they would change what they teach. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me with all my education and everything else is when Mary Lou came out of her bondage, she began to question everything. And so I'd give her the party line of what I was taught in seminary. And she says, oh, really? Prove it to me. (laughs) And she would force me. And I said, okay, I have got to exegete the Scripture myself. And I'd exegete the Scripture myself. And I said, dang, I was wrong. (laughs) Once you actually look at the Greek and the Hebrew, that isn't what it says. I don't even know how they got that. There's been a few times I told Mary, I said, I don't know what they were smoking. Yes, some of those old theologians with their pipes, you know, in the Reformation, they may not have always been tobacco. I don't don't know. (laughs) But the apostle Peter saw the day, the last days began on the day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Messiah. We're still in the last days, but turn to your neighbor and say, yeah, but we're in the last of the last of the last days, okay? (laughs) This thing's been winding down for 2,000 years. And he said, this is what was spoken by the prophet uh, Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour my spirit. How's that for internet connectivity? Holy Ghost connectivity. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young man shall see visions, and your old man shall dream dreams. That's why I still see visions. I refuse to acknowledge the fact that I'm getting old. I just have nighttime visions while I'm asleep, all right? (laughs) And on my servants and on my headmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and in signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Have we got there yet with that part? You see, Peter was prophesying, saying, this is beginning, and this is where we're heading. And how many know he's talking about where we're getting ready to head, Okay. But then he says, the, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall be blood before the great and uh, notable day of the Lord, which is the, the day of the Lord is the Valley of Armageddon. It's where everybody gets their comeuppance, okay? So whenever you talk about the day of the Lord, that, that is the day of his wrath, it's, it's one event. Now it's, it's memorialized in the day of atonement. That, you know, you have 10 days, 10 days of awe that you're told, okay, from the announcements that come with the Feast of Trumpets. You have 10 days to get right with God, get right with man. If you don't humble yourself, you're koshered, you're cut off. And it's a divine rehearsal of the Valley of Armageddon. So he says, we're heading on now, now whosoever shall believe in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But the first part of it, he said, listen, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh And we have replaced the dynamics of the kingdom with the dynamics of religiosity. That we are, we are infantile in our walk in the spirit of God. We don't understand kingdom. We don't, we don't understand. And how many times have believers been deceived because brother, he said all the right things. Yes, Elmer Gantry can. Now, for those of you that don't know, aren't old enough to know who Elmer Gantry was, he was a character played by Burke Lancaster that was a grifter that began preaching because he saw money in it. And people will come in, they learn your terminology, they, they say all the right things. And, and I, I have, guys, I had one guy go through our seminary, he had been a minute pastor for years, went through our seminary, 10 years after he graduated, he emailed me and said, while I was sitting in jail, I'm thinking, well, wait, what, what, what? <laughs> Things happened, he got drunk, 
start taking drugs, end up in jail. Okay, so you, were, you pastored for 20 years, went to seminary, pastored another 10 years, now you're sitting in jail. And he said, I realized I was never saved. I got saved in prison. I wonder how many times that has been replicated in the church. See, because I, don't, I, I, I cannot function in a normal church. I don't do politics. I am so quick to tell you that if you don't like the Word of God, let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Okay, I don't care. <laughs> right before I wrote the Shiner Directive, I'm sitting there, you know, preaching to my congregation. I said, that's it, I'm done. I'm only going to minister to the remnant. There's the door. And now my door's locked and I have a private TV studio. I don't care about numbers. All I care about is I got a handful of people that I have mentored in my own family. And they, they, the, 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 the harder I preach, the happier they get. I don't have to worry about people manifesting demons or people with DID popping up right in the middle trying to curse me or anything like that. I can just concentrate on ministering the word. And I'm going to deal with the remnant. I don't care where they are in the world. And what I found about the remnant, the more straight shooter you are, the more you become biblical, the more that you teach the word of God, the happier they get. Please stomp on my toes. If, my to, you know, if, if, I, if I let the devil get my toes out in the aisle, please stomp on them. Let me know before he cuts them off, please. We, we need to change our dynamics in the last days. It's not what the guy says, it's what the guy does. It's the spirit of the man. I've been around the world and what I've done in ministry and I have been in places that neither one of us spoke the same language. But what I could sense was Jesus. What I could sense was the kingdom. And I knew it was a brother. Or I knew it was a sister, or he was a sister in the Lord. Sometimes at the airport, if you really become sensitive to the things of the kingdom of God, because you have returned back to the basics, disciplines of the faith, and it starts with spending time in the word, you got to get back into kingdom programming because it's got to erase the programming of Babylon that you spent your whole life being programmed by the world into and have your brains washed by the water of the word. And quit arguing with the word. I was amazed at this fact. No matter how much education I have, I have discovered God's always right and I'm always wrong. <laughs> You know, anymore, you know, God will deal with me with something and I'll start arguing with God and God says, really, we're still there? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so which of my old teachings do I need to delete from the internet? <laughs> you know? we're, we're supposed to do this and approach God with meekness. There's things that we see in the book of Acts that should be commonplace in the church. The book of Acts does not have an end. With every epistle, there, you can sense there's a winding down of it. You know, there's coming to a close because, you know, the apostle Paul or Peter or whatever, they have wound up with the things, they, they, they have finished their argument, their discussion or whatever. And with Paul, it's like Jeopardy. You've got to figure out the question before you can understand the book. Amen? Because he was writing epistles. He learned from Gamaliel. And it was Gamaliel would be given a problem. He would pray, research scripture, and he would give them an answer via an epistle. That's where the apostle Paul got the idea. And so you have to figure out the question to understand what he told you. And so as, as, you, as you begin doing these things and, and learning these things, the book of Acts does not have a conclusion because we're still walking in it. But we've not been told that. And I, and I was raised missionary Baptist. I surrendered at a missionary Baptist altar. I tell people I'm Baptocostal with a good twist of Hebraic heritage. I'm kind of like that swirly ice cream, you know. And what I, you know, what I was taught is, you know, we need to get back to the book of Acts. And, 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 and every, that's what everybody always says, but they forget two components of the book of Acts. We're getting ready to get back there today. They became a minority. They were a minority. And they were persecuted.